Kelly McKinley. I am the JP in the Office of Mission and Ministry at Cristo Rey Jesuit in Baltimore. And um, I'm so excited to be here today with um, two current CRJ students, Deshaun and Ife, and one CRJ alum, Erin, and they are going to be talking to you about how they planned a Black Lives Matter Peace March this summer and um, kind of take you through what they did and talk to you about what you can do in your own community. So I'm going to hand it off over to Erin now. All right, so hey, everybody. Uh, as Ms. McKinley said, I'm Erin. I'm a class of 2019 graduate of Chris Story Jesuit High School in Baltimore, Maryland. I currently attend North Carolina a and State University as a pre-law major. My co-facilitators with me today are Deshaun and Ife, and I'll pass it over to them so they can explain a little bit about who they are. Hi, everyone. I'm Deshaun. I'm a current junior at Crystal Ray. I'm on the basketball team, and also I'm a peer minister. Uh, hello, I'm Ife, a current junior at Crystal Ray, a part of the group of change, really, and looking for just change in our community and, and betterment. Passing it off to Aaron again. All right, so let's begin on what you will get today. So today's workshop, we just went over our student leader introductions. Next, we're gonna give you kind of local context of the racial justice in Baltimore and why this uh, issue is important to us. Then we're gonna give you the steps that we took in order to create this protest. And lastly, we're gonna tell you the steps that you can do. So local racial justice in Baltimore, we have three things that we decided to present to you. One that I'll present is a fact versus fiction, Baltimore edition. So kind of talk about those uh, typical fiction that you hear about our city. Next, Deshaun will talk about the killing of Freddie Gray and the Baltimore riots and kind of give his personal narrative of how that affected him, how he felt, where he was. And then finally, uh, Ife is gonna talk about the intersection of the Baltimore criminal justice system and Black Lives Matter. And I'm, then I'm gonna sum up why all of this was important to us leading this protest. All right, so fact versus fiction, Baltimore edition. The first fiction that a lot of people have probably heard is Baltimore is a very dangerous place. Well, we all know that perspectives are based upon what you see and Baltimore doesn't get a lot of good media coverage. Most of the coverage we get is usually poor or it's usually something to do with negative perspectives of our city and more broadly negative perspectives with surrounding counties as well. If we had better news coverage, we would definitely be able to have a better perspective on what our city truly is. Second point, nothing good comes out of Baltimore. Nothing good comes out of Baltimore. We have Billie Holiday, musical artist, female, African-American, beautiful, straight out of Baltimore. ta Coates, best-selling author, Between the World and Me, straight out of Baltimore. Musical group, Druid Hill, <laughs> love them, straight out of Baltimore. Jada Pinkett Smith, actress, mentor, TV personality, you name it, she does it, right from Baltimore. Babe Ruth, baseball legend, Michael Phelps, Olympic gold medalist, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, Times 100 Most Influential People, Todd Gurley, football player, Thurgood Marshall, first African-American Supreme Court Justice, Ben Carson, world-renowned neurosurgeon, African-American, straight out of Baltimore, yet nothing good comes out of Baltimore. Nothing happens in Baltimore. Baltimore is dull, says many. Baltimore may be one of the most patriotic cities in our great nation. We have Fort McHenry, the home of the Star Spangled Banner, our great and beloved national anthem. We have the Baltimore Basilica, America's first and oldest cathedral. We have the best crab cakes on the East Coast and more nationally in the country. It's not debatable, we have the best. And we have one of the oldest malls in America, right in our city of Baltimore. Last point, Baltimore is not worth investing. We have two major investments in Baltimore. One, the headquarters of Under Armour, 
You've seen it in movies. You see it in everyday casual wear, athletic wear, football teams, you name it. Headquartered right here in Baltimore. Then lastly, we have Johns Hopkins, a world-renowned hospital with great surgeons, great doctors, great research comes out of Johns Hopkins right here in Baltimore. Please, please, please do not let the perspectives of media sway how you feel or view these cities. There is a lot of great things that happen and come out of these cities like Baltimore, Chicago. We just don't get enough credit. I'm gonna slide it over now to Deshaun so we can kind of talk about Freddie Gray, the riots and how that played a part. Like Aaron said, the riots played a big part in Baltimore and who we are today. So I'm gonna get into it. On April 12th, Freddie Gray was arrested and died a week later. During the time that he was arrested, he was being abused by the police officer and he said to them that he needed medical attention. During the 44 minute ride, he was not put in a seatbelt and his head was bumped against the paddy wagon. So then when he arrived at the police station, he was taken to the hospital by an ambulance. On April 27th, Freddie Gray was buried that afternoon. Rioting, looting, and arson broke out through the city. And then on May 1st, Maryland State Judge announced that charges were going to be against the officers. So on April 27th, I'm going to give my perspective of where I was and what was going on. So I was in elementary school at Gwens Falls Elementary, which is literally minutes from where the main riots began at Mondome Mall and Penn North area. During that time, it was basically like the people versus the police because we felt like we couldn't trust them. So we tried to like hurt them in any way possible. School was closed for a few days because no one knew what to do during the time. Then martial law was coming in, but people still wanted justice. Okay, so back to me, and I'm going to be talking about my standpoint on it and the injustice in the prison system. Okay, so just to really get a start into it, I want to talk about the facts, the real basis of it. Okay, so more than 60% of people of color make up the prison population. Not only that, but 5.1 times of black men are pr in prison rather to white men. And to really just dig deeper into that, I put a, is deeper than that, to just really explain it because it is deeper. I uh, go on to say that you see the numbers and the statistics, but it's way more than just that. It's breaking deeply into our communities and families and breaking hearts. When just, be, just based off of this, just based off of one mistake. And it's like, it's looked at as uh Black men are just doing more crime than white men. That's what the numbers are saying. But no, it's the harsh, harsh reality that the society and the system is refusing to face that the compassion is being taken up upon the white man and his white privilege that the black man is not seeing. And we're all doing the same crimes but the black man is just seeing a different result from it. One mistake is taking him and it's not taking his counterpart. We're being victimized. I'm not, we're being victimized. We're being animalized and looked at as terrible people for what is looked at by our white counterparts as a mistake, as com take compassion over them because it doesn't happen much with them and that's not true and it's too many times that it's too often and too many times you see white men getting 
off and getting off with shirt poor, shirt serve periods of times for what black men are given life for and animalized and demonized to be just a terrible person. We want to see the mercy that's being taken upon with his white counterpart in our community. We want to see that instead of it being every time we're demonized, we're animalized, we're just totally brought down and our counterparts aren't. It's just not right. And we deserve equal justice in that. Going back to Earn. So kind of like what me, F.A., and Deshaun have just shared with you all, there are many great things to our city, as well as many issues that happen. There are many things that we decided that enough was enough and we needed to do something about what was happening. So next, if they and Deshaun are gonna walk you through their thought process of how they decided to come up with this plan, then I'm gonna kinda tell you about how I played a part in making sure that they turn their idea into reality. So I'll pass it over now to Deshaun so he can explain their uh, thought process. Deshaun. So it all happened one day when Ife had seen like previous instant snaps from me when I was at a previous school uh, school peace march of for George Floyd that took place. So then he was like, we needed to come together and do something. So I agreed with him. So then we came together and tried to do something under the Crystal Ray name. So we reached out to the principal and other faculty staff members, they didn't get back to us instantly, but they got back to us in the end. So they connected us with Aaron, who helped us because he had previous experience with peace marches and protests. So then we started together to plan on a Monday for the march to be the next week. So we reached out to faculty members, staff, and other team members and alumni to help us out with the meet because the uh, with the protest because we couldn't do it alone by ourselves. So we put out flyers and we made them on Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, any social media that you could think of. And we also reached out to other schools. So the day before we reviewed the plan to make sure everything that went smooth the next day. So we took into account COVID-19, whether people needed masks, the extreme heat, we brought waters for everyone. And then also we planned for unexpected events such as police attacks and anything else that would happen. We successfully executed the march on June 8th, 2020. The march was led from Crystal Ray to the jail, then to City Hall and then back. And uh, Deshaun, kind of elaborate a little bit more of why you guys decided to take that route from Crystal Ray to uh, local jail, then to City Hall. And, and what, what did you guys do once you got to City Hall? So we went to the jail because there are people every day wrongly convicted and we they don't have the proper treatment. So we wanted the police to know that we wanted to be seen. Then also we went to City Hall and we took an eight minute, 46 second kneel to represent the time that the police kneeled on George Floyd's neck. So as you all can see, create an idea definitely isn't easy. And if and Deshaun, what they decided to do, kind of like what Deshaun had talked about, they reached out to me. They're like, hey, we know that you do a lot of work in different cities uh, with different protests, whether it's being a part of organizing. We know that you have experience. We want to do something and we want you to help us. And it was good for me. I felt like I had to help them in the sense of Throughout my time at Crystal Ray, I held very leaders, various leadership positions, and mentorship is important. And, and you, an effective leader builds up the next generation of leaders. So to have them reach out, it, it was kind of like a confirmation of I had done good work. I was, I was a good man for others because now I have other people who are under me coming down to want to do the same thing. So basically what I did, I helped Ife and Deshaun develop their plan. I uh, guided them along the way, asking them questions like, hey, did you take into account this? What are you going to do about that? What if this happens? And I, I just guided them and showed them the steps and helped them 
to develop their own steps to make sure that they were putting on a very successful peace march. So now I'm going to pass it over to uh, Ife and Deshaun. To, so they kind of talk about through this process, both in the developing the idea, planning and executing some of the skills that they learned along the way. Uh, Ife and Deshaun. Um, first, I want to start out with the leadership skills and the details that it took just for us to plan this, really. So to give some insight, we not only had to have water bottles, make sure people wore that mask, but we had to make sure that our leadership skill, our leadership roles were known to the crowd so they know who to go to if they needed anything. We had to make sure the back of the crowd knew what was going on with the front of the crowd and vice versa. We had to make sure it was all uh, awareness and we were all on the same page and no chaos. We had to make sure it was done and executed perfectly. We had to block off streets and we had to assign people to do that. Like me and Deshaun, we were in the streets um, stopping cars, making sure that all of our people were getting through and that our message was getting across. And not just that, but we had to make sure that we had our water bottles and our mask for the people so they could stay hydrated and be good all throughout. Deshaun? So the teamwork aspect we learned, it kind of ties in with the leadership skills but also when planning something, we need teamwork is key because without teamwork, it wouldn't go smooth. So we had different roles for everyone, such as we had leaders that blocked off the streets. We had people that led chants. And then also we just had people marching with us. No matter what your role was, we all were a part of the one team and we got the job done. One thing that was key was timing. So we arrived at the school around 11 o'clock. And then we had to wait 20 minutes for everyone to come. Even if there were some people that were late, they still caught up to the crowd. Also, the key timing part that was very like important and deep to us was that when we got to City Hall, we did an eight minute and 46 second kneel. No matter what age we were, old, young, we all kneeled to represent the police kneeling on George Floyd's neck to let everyone know how hard it felt. As you all can see, uh, there throughout this process of executing an event, there are a lot of things that come with it. A lot of simple things, actually. It is not as hard as it seems. And kind of the five steps that we just explained, you got to first have an idea. A lot of times we doubt ourselves because we feel like our idea is too small or our idea is too big or we don't have the right amount of resources or we don't and we kind of count ourselves out so what i ask you to do have an idea that's where it starts once you have your idea bring in other people bring in people who are as passionate as you bring in people who you know will be as committed as you bring in people who want change having a solid team as deshaun just said will be the way to make sure that you execute efficiently, effectively, and safely. And once you do that, you're gonna identify your roles. So when identifying roles, no matter what the role is, everyone participates. With us, we had people, as I said previously, blocking off streets, chanting, and then some people just walking. Everyone matters when it comes to identifying roles. And then next, after you had identified the roles, you had an idea and you brought other people in, you develop a plan. Without a plan, everything wouldn't run smooth. With our plan, we plan to go to jail. We plan to go to City Hall. So then once we already had our plan established, we plan where we would meet up, the timing and everything, and hope everything ran smooth. So these are the short five steps that you can do to make sure that you get your idea off the ground. We've also attached two documents. Uh, that's a more detailed checklist for things that you can do that elaborates on having an idea, what type of ideas you might have, on bringing in other people, the type of people you can tap into within your own personal organizations, 
identifying roles, the roles that you may need in order to execute this, how to create a plan, the things that you might not think about, and most importantly, your execution. Doing the social justice work is not easy. It's definitely a challenge, but we did it and we know that you can too. You joined in today because you're passionate, you're motivated, you want change. So what we ask you to do now is take this that you heard today, use it. We thank you for coming with us. We thank you for wanting to create change. We thank you for being passionate. We thank you for devoting time. We thank you for wanting to learn. This is not easy work, but with us working together, we can create change. We can change our cities. We can change our states. We can change our nation. We can change our world. One movement, one idea at a time.